welcome to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center's Take Leadership Series. My name is Deidre Teagarden. I'm the Executive Director here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, where our mission is to inspire people to find the hero within themselves through the legacy of our Nisei veterans. And you can find out more information about our center on the web at nvmc.org. We are so thrilled to have all of you join us again today to uh, hear from General David Bramlett in this second of his series about the Nisei soldier in World War II. Today, he will be focusing on the 100th Infantry Battalion. Now, before I introduce General Bramlett, I just wanted to let everybody know, as always, we love to get your questions and we'll get to as many as time allows. There is a question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen. So feel free to type in your questions as they come to you and we will get to as many as we can. This is being recorded and will be available on our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center YouTube channel in about a week. So we encourage you to check out our YouTube channel and any other talks you may have missed in the past. And of course, we couldn't do this without the generous support of our corporate donors. You saw their logos as you were getting into the call today. So we just wanna thank all of them for making this and all of our programs possible here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center. Now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, and I'm going to put on my glasses so that I don't miss any of the details. A 1964 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, General Bramlett began his career in Hawaii as a Lieutenant of Infantry with the 25th Infantry Division. He retired on October 31, 1998, concluding his military career as the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Forces Command. As commander of the Army's largest organization, he was responsible for training and deploying forces worldwide in support of theater combatant commanders. While in retirement, he has been a formal mentor and an occasional participant in seminars on security issues and international affairs. He has also been an adjunct instructor with the Hawaii Pacific University in the graduate school in courses in history and literature and a regent of Chaminade University. He currently works as a volunteer on the management boards of several community service organizations on Oahu. His commitment to telling the Nisei story is reflected in his volunteer work with the Nisei Forum on Universal Values, the Gopher Broke National Education Center, and in numerous speeches, both in Hawaii and on the mainland, as well as in England. And the 100th Battalion veterans in Hawaii have selected him to be an honorary member of Club 100. He is married to Dr. Nora Harmson, who is also helping out on the call today. So let's give General Bramlett a warm Maui virtual welcome. General Bramlett, aloha, and thank you for coming back. Thank you, Deirdre, and, and I felt the warm virtual aloha. Thank you very much. And allow, allow, <laughs> allow me to, to also appreciate uh, your our viewers that are tuned in for the story of the 100th Infantry Battalion. Might I talk just a couple of minutes before I start the presentation? It's going to be an overview of the 100th Battalion. So some of the battles that made them famous, I'll touch on aspects of it. Some of the facts and figures I give you are the best that I can find. I've learned that there are many different views and many different numbers. So those of you that are, are far more expert than I, uh, please give me your, your grace on my presentation. I want the audience to get a feel for who these extraordinary men were and what they accomplished. And I'll do my best in 45 minutes or so to do that and in any questions we have at the conclusion and I'll be happy to answer. One thing I would mention that, that those of you who have studied World War II have studied the Nisei soldier. Most, um, I would say the plurality of military historians have concluded that the fighting in Italy was the most savage and brutal of any of the fighting in the European theater. It's underappreciated by historians in general because it was greatly overshadowed by, of course, Normandy and, and the, the race to Berlin. So it's something to keep in mind when I talk about some of the struggles the Hunt Battalion faced when it went to Italy. 
let's start at the beginning. And, and to do that, I will do my best to screen share. Okay. As you noticed uh, from the introduction, technology was not one of my specialties in my background. I was a garden variety infantryman. Fortunately, I have my wife here to assist. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Where did the 100th Battalion come from? It came from Hawaii, as I think most of you know. And in 1941, to give you a feel, 37% of Hawaii's population, uh, about 158,000, were Japanese descent. Those born in the territory, of course, were American citizens uh, called Nisei, second generation. Um, many of them, the Nisei, were attending the University of Hawaii. They were in the ROTC program. They were doing things young people do as best they can. 1940 was an eventful year uh, for the Nisei in Hawaii, for they had the opportunity, if not the requirement, to serve in the Army, actually the Hawaii National Guard. Those of you who may remember, if you study history, in September 1940, the, they passed, the nation passed the Selective Service Act which is the draft. It was passed and included a provision that there would, be, there would be no discrimination for those in military service. In October 1940, the Hawaii Territorial Guard was essentially federalized and became the Hawaii National Guard. And a fed, federalized, the Hawaii National Guard consisted of two regiments, the 298th and 299th. There were a total of 110 officers and a little over 1,700 enlisted men. Interestingly, there were no Nisei officers and there were only 40 Nisei enlisted men. There was a policy, informal though it be, that uh, limited the number of Nisei that could be in the National Guard. However, the following month, November 1940, the Hawaii National Guard inducted the draft, to remember, 3,000 individuals, of which 1,500 were Nisei. Most of them went to the 298th and 299th. In fact, in, in just before December 7, 1941, about two-thirds of the National Guard were Nisei. Interesting. Six months prior to 7 December, uh, Harold E. Case, the Secretary of the Interior, gave a wonderful speech in Washington, D.C. And he said, among other things, an American is one who will sacrifice property, ease, and security in order that he and his children may retain the rights of free men. That becomes ironic when you think of the 100th Battalion sacrifice in blood and everything else they had to put on the line to fulfill that promise to be a citizen and guarantee the rights of free men. Now on 7 December, the, with the attack, the 298th uh, was on the, uh, for the second battalion of the 298th was on the west coast of Hawaii uh, guarding facilities. And the, the first of the 298th uh, was in Schofield Barracks. They immediately assumed defensive positions. They were augmented by 317 Nisei ROTC cadets from the UH ROTC. Though those cadets were, were summarily discharged in January of 1942, the National Guard, the 298th, continued uh, to its guard positions for the, about the next six months, as did the 299th on the Outer Islands. In May of 1942, the, the governor, the military governor, General Emmons, in Hawaii, realized he had to do something with the Nisei um, still in the National Guard. They couldn't be discharged like they did the ROTC cadets because they were already in the Army and the anti-discrimination clause did not allow them to be discharged. There were more troops pouring into Hawaii that could take care of the security of Hawaii. So Emmons recommended that they be formed into a provisional infantry battalion. General Marshall initially balked at the idea and then changed his mind in early June and said, okay, we're gonna send them to the mainland for training. Uh, this was at the typical National Guard circa 1941-42. This is his kit or his, his equipment and what they had before they head to the mainland. When the battalion, provisional battalion was formed, 
uh, they formed from the existing leadership in the National Guard. And there are the key leaders. Uh, there was Colonel Turner, Farrant Turner, battalion commander. Uh, he had been a guardsman since 1926. He was a World War I veteran. And he had a good, a very senior position with the building supply company in Honolulu. And he had been the XO of the 298th. And he insisted that he be the commander of the provisional battalion, which was formed of all Nisei. Uh, he was initially not the first choice. The regimental commander wanted somebody else, but he was overruled and Colonel Turner is, he got the position. He brought with him the regimental S3, uh, Major Jim Lovell that you see centered up. Lovell was a teacher by profession. He had taught at Roosevelt and McKinley High Schools, and he knew a lot of the Nisei from his school days to say nothing to the National Guard. And of course on the, I say of course, uh, Captain Jack Johnson was a battalion S3. He was better known in Hawaii as a star football player for the University of Hawaii. Now the officers uh, were restricted in terms of who could command the companies of this provisional battalion. The battalion was gonna be simply 10 officers and 250 soldiers in the headquarters. And there were already four other companies with 10 officers and 250 soldiers. But the officers, the Nisei officers, could not command companies. But instead, uh, they could take miscellaneous jobs. Now, of, this, of the officers, many uh, Haoles or Caucasian, uh, of those officers, 16 were AJAs, Americans of Japanese ancestry, or Nisei. Here's a picture of 13 of the 16. Um, Interestingly, those of us in Hawaii may recognize a lot of these because they went on to more very prominent positions. Here we have Sakai Takahashi, Mitsu Fukuda, and Richard Mizuda. Remember I said the company commanders were all to be Caucasian. As soon as Colonel Turner got the battalion to the mainland in training, he began to systematically put the best qualified. In fact, by the battle that joined in Italy, uh, Takahashi will command Bravo Company, Mitsufukuda will command Alpha Company, and um, Richard Mazuda will command Charlie Company. Mitsufukuda will go on to become the last commander of the 100th Battalion uh, in the war, and he will also be the first Asian American to command American Infantry Battalion in our history. And of course, uh, I say, of course, Spark Matsunada is centered up. Uh, again, they're, they're the names here. You may recognize, those of you in Hawaii may recognize some of your, your uh, ancestors. And then, of course, the soldiers. Uh, the soldiers of the Nisei, there was about 1,300, a little over 1,300 actually deployed in June. Uh, they were older than the average soldier. Uh, they were 24 because they had been in the guard. Uh, they uh, averaged four feet, four inches, weighed 125 pounds. 26 inch waist, oh my goodness, and 13 and a half inch neck and 25 inch seam. The M1 rifle was almost as big as they were. Uh, their first posting was Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. Uh, they, they took the ship uh, at night, got on a train and went to McCoy. Now, this is a picture in front of the barracks they eventually got to. When they first got there, they were put in pup tents. Well, actually a little bit larger than pup tents, four to a tent. And they eventually got into these billets. Their training consisted of uh, soldier skills, shooting, marksmanship, physical fitness, uh, those things to hone you, uh, your tactical and skill level as a soldier. They also found uh, the natives to be friendly uh, they went into town. Sparta, Wisconsin was, was nearby. The people of Wisconsin embraced the Nisei soldiers, became very fond of them. This is a favorite picture uh, of, of one of the, the youngsters in Sparta, and they became very popular. Uh, this is their training. As I told you, they did individual training. This is, of course, training on a 30 caliber machine gun. Uh, haircut isn't training, but they are in the Army, and they're supposed to get their hair cut. I might say something about weapons training. I often wondered why the Nisei soldiers could seemingly pick up a weapon off the battlefield and use it. 
Colonel Turner and the staff took advantage of this time to cross train the soldiers. So the soldiers could all fire the machine gun. They knew how to fire it, clean it, clear it, and can resume firing. They could fire the M1 with, a, with or without a grenade launcher, the Thompson submachine gun. This would be invaluable. And it, it answered the question I've had is how could they readily use other weapons they found on the battlefield? Here's some just pictures of training. Uh, I must confess, some of these may be, in fact, be uh, from Camp uh, Shel Shelby, where they will go later. But you get the idea. Lecture training. This was clearly for the folks back home posed. This is more my favorite picture. This is soldiers at rest. Now, they did such a good job at, at, in their six months at, at Camp McCoy that the Army said, wow, if they're this good, why not? have a full regiment of Nisei soldiers. And so they put out the call, and this is a letter from General Emmons, and it says their representatives, that's the Nisei, in the 100th Infantry Battalion, a combat unit now in training on the mainland, and the Varsity of Victory Volunteers, these were the ROTC cadets that, that looked for another way to serve, and other men of Japanese extraction and armed forces have also established a fine record. This is the opportunity in the form of voluntary combat service in the armed forces. Uncle Sam wants you because of what the 100th Battalion and the Varsity Victory Volunteers did. Off to Camp Shelby. Uh, Camp Shelby, uh, this, this is actually the billets they stayed in. Uh, this is some of the boys. They didn't spend a lot of time in Shelby. You see, they, as a separate battalion, had to learn how to work with large units for other, other regiments, divisions. And so they were in the field practicing large unit tactics. They participated in the Louisiana maneuvers. They were initially attached to the 85th Division. Uh, they got uh, attached to a lot of people in the field in Louisiana. In fact, they, their, their biggest threats were not the, the opposing force, but rather chiggers, ticks, and poisonous snakes, especially the chiggers. I can report to you by personal experience that chigger will find any spot on your body. And a lot of the boys were at home about chiggers among other threats that they formed. While there, they were joined by other AJAs, Nisei, from uh, already in the army. They were uh, reassigned to join the 100th at, at Camp Shelby. Uh, they also picked up one notable addition and that was a Korean American, Lieutenant Young Oak Kim. He arrives a brand new second lieutenant right out of training. He volunteered to serve with the 100th. He did not want to be assigned to admin duty, which was the Army's plan. Uh, Colonel Turner said, will you be comfortable uh, working with the, the Japanese Americans, the Nisei? And he said, sure, we're all Americans. I'll get along. Now, he was spit and polish. And the boys from Hawaii, uh, nicknamed him G.I. Kemp because he was far more formal and official than they wanted to put up with, but they did, and they came to love him and changed his name once they got into battle from G.I. Kemp to Samurai Kemp. The division, uh, the battalion, and according to Jim Lovell, and I read his oral history, was the most looked at inspected battalion in the Army to make sure they were ready. Finally, they were declared ready. And before they left, they had a short link up with the 442nd that had been recruited and had been sent to Shelby for training. And so in, in, uh, near the end of their training, in the end of June, they had some time to spend with the 442nd. Uh, they got a lot of catching up on families and, and whatever was going on back in Hawaii. And then they were ready to go. Oh, one thing I should mention before they're ready to go. Maintenance training. This is part of the training at, at um, Camp Shelby. Uh, a son or daughter, it was a son, asked me, how can my dad get the CIB, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, when he was a mechanic and he was in supply? Uh, and I explained to him that in all probability, the, the boys showed up at Camp Shelby and Camp McCoy, all as infantrymen. And then they got trained in their specialty. We had to have supply people. We had to have maintenance people. And they probably always kept their infantry designation, even though they might have been mechanics or supply. 
And once they got shelled or mortared or sniped at or got in a fight, then they qualified for the combat infantryman's badge. And I looked at some the, the, the maintenance units uh, in the 100th and 442nd, and I saw a lot of them had the CIP. And I think that's a reasonable explanation. In any case, they were ready to go in June of 1943. Uh, they went to uh, port of debarkation. They joined the 34th Infantry Division uh, in North Africa. When they got there, uh, General Ryder was happy to have them. Speaking of happy to have them, so was General Mark Clark in the, the Fifth Army. Uh, they were offered to General Eisenhower, and he declined to accept them uh, in the in the, the run up to the Normandy, uh, the invasion in France. And so Mark Clark was happy to have them. They arrived in North Africa. They were assigned to the 133rd Regiment. And so Colonel Turner and the leadership went over to greet them. They were greeted like brothers. The 133rd embraced them, said, bring, bring the guys over. Let's have a, a what amounted to a, a Midwestern luau. And they really felt uh, welcome uh, the 100th Battalion did by the 133rd and 34th. And off they were to the Salerno. They joined the Salerno beachhead and got there, got in order and moved on in their first combat, combat operation down in this direction. Now I'm just gonna talk about some of the key points, but this is the odyssey of the 100th Battalion when they left Salerno. And they moved by truck along this route, relatively uneventful, they disembarked and they ran into the first firefight, the Germans, <clears throat> and I'll talk about their defensive tactics throughout the battle in Italy. They ran into them at Castle Viteri. Uh, an element of B Company was coming and bending the road. They were getting some artillery fire and they came under machine gun fire. Uh, Sergeant Joe Takata, a leader in the element, went forward as leaders do and said, let me go forward and make an assessment of the situation. He was hit by machine gun fire, mortally wounded. He stayed, stayed there, directed his soldiers where the machine gun fire was coming for, for and continued to lead until he died. I think it worthwhile to, to reflect on the Joe Takata. Uh, he was a great baseball player. In fact, there's a field named for him at Fort Shafter and why. Uh, here's the, the baseball team. You can see Colonel Turner, and I think that's uh, Major Lovell. And somewhere in there's Joe Takata. I have not blown the picture up to find him exactly, but I thought it was appropriate for to have his buddies here with Joe. For his gallantry in action in the face of enemy fire, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award the country gave, can give for courage and gallantry. It was a, a forerunner of the tradition of sacrifice and heroism that characterized the 100 Battalion and indeed the 442nd when they followed them. Benevent Benevento, when the battalion got up there, they had been through some rugged fighting to get there and they seized the town of Benevento. And meanwhile, they had been mentioned in dispatches and that's when the official report goes to higher headquarters and units are mentioned for their, their extraordinary achievement. And they were cited for covering approximately 50 miles in 24 hours from Monte Atamarano to Monte Falciono. That's uh, 15 miles. They covered 24 hours uh, under difficult conditions facing skilled Sherman delaying tactics. I won't repeat this, but you can visualize this happening again and again. The Germans were in defensive positions. They would fire and they, they had machine guns everywhere, uh, machine, machine gun positions. They would fire, call artillery, mortar, have mines. Mines are things you step on and they blow up and kill you and anybody near you. They would race to vehicles, drop back five or six miles under artillery and mortar fire. And they do the same thing over and over and over again. The rule of thumb in military tactics is the attacker must have three to one advantage over the defender. Rarely 
in the battles that I follow with the 100 Battalion, did they have that kind of ratio? They either made their success by sheer grit and courage, or they just maneuvered in a position. Uh, but again, this recognition allowed them to be awarded the authority to wear the 34th Infantry patch. And my, my favorite, the little anime, but there's the patch, and you remember from there, right, the Red Bull. Many in the 100th Battalion wore that patch, even though they became later attached to the 442nd, because they were so fond and felt such a part of the, of the 34th Infantry. They continued on, and again, visualize fighting this delaying action all the way. You remember how Italy is shaped. It's easy for the Germans to defeat, to set up defensive lines across Italy and force the allies to constantly fight as they fall back in the mountainous terrain. They proceeded up to San Angelo de Lifi. And there it, they fought one of the first of the many brutal fighting, fighting they will do. Uh, once they faced the usual mines, machine guns, mortars, tanks, and infantry, uh, they would have to attack uh, near that little town. Their mission was to seek a mountain uh, hill, objective 529. You'll see these numbers again, they're in meters. So you have to multiply by three and see it's a little over 1600 feet. Uh, it's, a, it's a hill or a mountain. Uh, but the Germans had the high ground, they had to attack. Because they had to move through a valley to attack, they had chose to move at night. A company was leading on the night of October 20th. As they moved out, they noticed a farmhouse with a light open. They went to the farmhouse to check it out. It was an ambush. And German machine guns opened up, killing 10 members of A Company and wounding 20. To advance was suicide, so the soldiers sought cover in a hollow. And it's a depression, if you will. And they tried to recover their wounded as best they could. Uh, the, the regimental commander, well, the 133rd, ordered A Company pull back. Colonel Turner protested. He said, I can bring up B and C Company and take the objective. But he was overruled by his commander. Uh, A Company pulled back. And the next morning, on, on October 22nd, uh, they attacked. Now, for the first time, they got the the, the German Nebelwerfers, that's the English pronunciation, uh, known as screaming Mimis. The rockets would come in and they'd make a horrible wailing sound, terrifying sound. Every soldier in fought in the European theater has talked about their first exposure to screaming Mimis. They also had a tank attack. Now the tank attack was blooded by Private Masao Awakuni. Uh, he held his ground and knocked a tank out with his bazooka. He will do this later and earn the title of the tank buster. Sergeant Sakamoto, for example, stopped an attack by uh, flinging grenades. He was a good baseball player. And German positions stopped forcing them to retreat. Finally, the company A and C made a frontal assault on Hill 529. Uh, they finally got there, but they suffered casualties. And Colonel Turner sent companies E and F to relieve Company A and C continue the attack. Those companies moved around the hill to avoid a frontal assault, and they finally forced the Germans to withdraw. It took the 100 five days to move seven miles. They lost 21 dead, 67 wounded, to include the battalion XO Major Lovell. I won't go into all this detail on other battles, but to give you an idea how tough it was, when you get up in that part of Italy, in fact, Italy in the interior is a series of hills and mountains, and the 100th had to fight up and down, up and down, the Germans always holding the decisive terrain. This was a signal event uh, for the battalion in its life. Colonel Turner was recalled and sent to the rear of, uh, to a hospital to medical treatment. Uh, it had taken a terrible toll on him as he had led this battalion from its formation, through its training, through its first contact with the enemy, all the way up to, to San Angelo and Delifi. It had taken a toll, terrible, many people have written about the emotional toll it took on him to see his boys, that he had fought to give them the right to fight. And then he saw so many fall in the road from Salerno uh, to San Angelo and Delifi. 
that his age and the fatigue of commanding in combat uh, brought uh, him out of the fight. The battalion was saddened to see him go, as they called him the old man. A lot of talk, I've read a lot of commentary when we realized the old man was gone. Fortunately, they got a good combat experience to, officer from the 34th Division came over, Major Gillespie. In fact, uh, all the battalion commanders of the 100 seemed to be pretty competent, but a lot of them got wounded uh, for understandable reasons. Some pictures for the fighting in Italy. Uh, note the, the Red Bull. And these are just miscellaneous pictures to give you a flavor. No, notice the rolling terrain and they're coming up a hill. And also, uh, I, I wanted to put this in to, for, this was done by one of the members uh, of, of the battalion, I think, but if, if not the 442nd, but it captures the Nisei humor. Uh, this, he wants to know when Japan changed sides. That question was asked a lot when, when the Nisei would capture Germans that could speak English or through an interpreter. They wanted to know why uh, the Japanese were fighting on the American side. Um, they continued on. This is San Angelo de Leafy. Notice the Volturno River. They will cross this river three times. It's a very dangerous thing to cross rivers. Uh, they, they weigh the river, they're vulnerable in their water. They cross it, um, they cross it again, and then they cross it up here at the Volturno River. This is the third crossing. And th this is an interesting crossing. Uh, because it involved uh, three people, you wonder what do these three men have in common? Sakai Takahashi, General Eisenhower, and Yungo Kim. Here you see they cross the river and just tactically an element moves up here, goes up here and see the objectives. These are all hills or mountains, 590, 600, 610, 1800 feet, 1800 feet, a little over 1800 feet. B Company goes here and they get fired on. And uh, young old Kim as a lieutenant, he's, he dives on one side of the road, the other officer dies on this side of the road. And in the ensuing melee, B Company thinks both officers have been captured. So the sergeant nearby orders all the B Company around him, fix bayonets, and they charge. And, and they find young old Kim, I'm not sure he was captured, but it is reported to be the first bayonet charge in the Italian theater. Now you see the sign, the Jeep. What Eisenhower, for reasons I don't know, and I've never heard this story, came forward with General, uh, uh, Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt, the son of the president, the former president, <coughs> came up to check out, I think the fighting the Nisei were doing. And he got it right here and he got strafed by a German fighter plane. Ike dives, uh, Roosevelt dives, and somewhere near here was Sakai Takahashi, unbeknownst to Eisenhower and Roosevelt, obviously. A decade later, when Eisenhower, then the president, visits Kaneohe uh, Marine Corps base in, in Hawaii, uh, Sakai Takahashi, a state senator, goes up to him and says, Mr. President, do you remember when you hit the dirt when you came out to see us? And Ike brightened up. And he said, were you there? And of course, Sakai said, yes, I was. And the two old soldiers had a chuckle. And I thought that would be worth, worth sharing. Uh, there was a lot of chaos and struggle, as I described earlier, to take uh, this area. Then it was on to Sarasuolo. They, again, this is just a route of march. Notice they don't want to cross the Volturna River again. At Sarasuolo, it was a very tough fight. Next. And this gives you an idea of, of the battle. Now these, these sketches, the best sketches I could find, these are handmade, but, it, but they were done obviously by people there or talking to people who were there. The 100 Battalion came up to take this high ground, 841, 1017, uh, 920, with the ultimate objective, La Cruce. I'm not trying to make all of you army tacticians, but to give you an idea of what they went through. A and B Company was to take 841, and Charlie Company was to take uh, 920. Uh, a and B Company fought for two weeks over 841, to give you an idea. 
how difficult it was. Uh, they ran into mines, rifle, machine gun, mortar fires, um, and they fought back and forth and back and forth. On A Company, on their right flank during one of their attacks, Shizuya Hayashi dashed forward one man. He destroyed a machine gun nest, um, killed nine people. Then an any aircraft gun was depressed to fire on the infantry. He attacked single-handedly the anti-aircraft gun, uh, killed nine of its crew, and forced four of them to flee, taking out of action. He was later awarded uh, the Medal of Honor. On B Company's uh, right flank, uh, they suffered on an attack on their flank. Alan Ohara and Mikio Hasamoto were two men on the flank. They single-handedly um, forced an attack of 40 plus Germans uh, to fall back. In the first attack, they killed 27, wounded one and captured one. The remnants of that re-attacked again and they killed four more and captured uh, and wounded three. Uh, for that, they later, later would be awarded the Medals of Honor. Miki Hasamoto, sadly, the next day was killed by mortar fire. Again, an example of the fighting. They, after these battles, they rested, came back, had some rest, then trekked up here. Notice all the high ground, fights along the way. And then they got to the Rapido River and Monte Cassino. Uh, this is where they earned the nickname, the, I, uh, the Purple Heart Battalion, and the news media dubbed them the Purple Heart Battalion, as well as the Little Men of Iron. They were astounded. The Rapido River was dammed by the Germans. This is a contemporary photo of the, the area. You can see the, the swamp created by damming a river. And sometimes it's all water, waist deep, hip deep, and there was just swamp. This was two miles to the base of Monte Cassino. And the little town of Cassino, I think, is right in that area. Uh, the attack, the 100th Battalion uh, had to attack across the two miles then take uh, an intermediate objective to support the attack on Monte Cassino. Now, in that swamp area, in that two miles, here's what they had. This is a German, a German map of what they faced uh, in that, that marsh, if you will. There was the muddy area, and there were some deep irrigation ditches where you can imagine when you stepped into it, you would fall up. There was a minefield, and they had wire all along here. They had mines in here, and then they had machine gun fire from Monte Cassino into this, this zone. Then once they got here, they had a stone wall they had to scale. Now the riverbed was dry, but they had to go back down in the riverbed, go across the riverbed, crawl up and breach a double row barbed wire fence, all under fire. Back to the scene. This is what it looked like. And this is the 100th approach. A and C Company said, we're going to attack at night. They crawled the two miles across the floodplain, uh, hoping to get to the wall. Uh, they got to the river wall, but they had casualties strung out throughout this two mile. Many were killed and they were wounded, crying for help. And once they got here, they were under fire the whole time. They could hold on to the wall, but they couldn't go back and help them. Um, Mitz Fukuda, A Company commander, crawled back and reported to the battalion commander. He said, this is what we're facing. The battalion commander um, was told by the regimental commander. The battalion commander now was a major clue. And the, the regimental commander said, I want you to attack at daylight. He said, it's suicide. I won't do it. Major clue refused to do it. So the, the regimental commander relieved him and put uh, another commander in, uh, Major Dewey, said, you're now the battalion commander, you do it. Well, he, the only company left was B Company. And so Takahashi uh, went back and talked to his lieutenants. Takahashi says he was initially going to refuse the order, but he talked to the lieutenants and said, let's give it a try. Well, they tried it in daylight and they had smoke and they were doing okay 
until the wind blew the smoke away and now they were exposed in daylight. Remember, Elf and Charlie Company, A and C, went at night. So they were out there in the daylight. Takahashi actually got to the wall, <coughs> excuse me, but he suffered horrendous casualties. Uh, only 14, I think it was 14 people got there um, and they just couldn't go any further uh, until they pulled back and went further away, were able to finally cross the river and then they had the fight in the casino, the little town of Casino. And also they were told to take Castle Hill. Here is, here is uh, Monastery Hill where the Abbey was or Mount Casino, if you will. They got, they got their objective, but they got to Castle Hill, but here's Castle Hill. They were on one side and the Germans were on the other side. And the Germans had the best positions and so the 100th Battalion got in there, A and C Company, and they couldn't move. And so they took a pummeling because they were just trapped. They couldn't back up and they couldn't go forward. All they could do is return fire and hold what they had. This combination of fighting at Castle Hill and traversing the, the flood of Rapido River Plain was where they earned the name, and sadly, the Purple Heart Battalion or the Little Men of Iron. Um, B Company went into the village and fought door to door. Um, it was a feat of arms that, that rivals. Some people have talked about it equal to the siege of Stalingrad or some of the great uh, battles in Europe. Again, often overlooked, but not by the men of the 100th Battalion or the men of the 34th Infantry. This is what Monte Cristo looks like today. This is what it looked like after uh, the Allies couldn't take it they decided to just bomb it. And this is what it looks like. Today, at the top of Monte Cassino in the, in, the, um, in the Abbey, there is a stained glass window in tribute to the 100th Battalion. And there's a plaque at the base, again, in tribute to the 100th Battalion for their extraordinary heroism and sacrifice. Because of the battle and losses they suffered, they were brought back to Anzio. They were put on a ship and brought back to Anzio where they started. I'm excuse me, uh, Anzio, a different beachhead. They came back here and they um, joined the uh, forces there. There was a beachhead at Anzio that had stalled. There was no breakout. The hope was that we could land at Anzio and the forces threatening uh, Rome would force other units, German units, to come back, but it didn't happen. Um, once they got there, they, uh, the next one, go back. No, just, they're right there. They moved uh, this perimeter. I'm sorry, I can't make it. Yeah, here's the perimeter. And there were thousands and thousands of soldiers hemmed in here. The Germans were out here, and there was about a, a two-mile area that was considered a no man's land, like World War I. The, the hunter comes in here, they get they get replacements finally. And so they're they're at a, an increased strength. They were down to 40, 40 percent of their authorized strength at the casino. And by the way, only 17% of the original members of a 100th Battalion were still there. That gives you an idea of the casualties. Um, they had no intelligence of what the German, German dispositions were. They had no prisoners of war. And so young Oak Kim, uh, Lieutenant, he takes a private from the headquarters and three other soldiers, and they volunteered to go out and bring prisoners back. And so young Oak and, and private Irving uh, Akahoshi, they crawl out 300 yards. Uh, they leave three soldiers behind. They crawl into a German position and capture two Germans and drag them back uh, to the lines and be interrogated about German dispositions. General Mark Clark comes in personally to give the DSC to both uh, young Oak Kim and uh, Irving Akahoshi. Uh, the intelligence is helpful. There is a breakout from Anzio, 
and the 100th Battalion, now with replacements, moves along this route in the breakout. And then they go in the final uh, fight is Lanuvio. And Lanuvio uh, is, is the last firm defense before Rome is open. And the Germans decided not to destroy Rome and leave it uh, as an open city, if you will. Um, two men uh, earned the Medal of Honor that was later presented. We'll talk about that if we have time. Uh, Shinye Nakamine and Yeki Komashikawa. Uh, both men uh, earned their Medals of Honor by taking out machine gun positions. I told you the Germans used machine guns and mines. Uh, Kobashigawa took out four machine gun positions. He took some soldiers with him, but you talk about a leader by example. And by the way, he attacked six machine, uh, four machine gun positions, destroyed two of them, and the other two fled. Uh, Nakamine uh, by himself took out two machine gun positions and was attacking a third when he was mortally wounded. Um, that opened up the road that was the last strong defense of the Germans before Rome. The 100th Battalion thought surely we're only six miles away, we'll get to march into Rome. And they were told to stand on the roadside and other units pass by. Uh, a lot of the veterans I talked about, uh, they're gone now, but they resented that. They felt they had paid the price. They broke through the last strong German defenses at Lanubio and were denied. Uh, the, the official explanation was they needed to be transported back and uh, link up with the 442nd. They did link up with the 442nd. Um, and before I talk about the, the exploits of the 100th within the 442nd, I must report that the 100th Battalion did not want to give up its designation as 100th Infantry Battalion separate. They wanted to hold on to it, but not to be because they were attached formally to the 442nd as their third battalion. Their first battalion had been uh, used as replacements really for the 100th Battalion. So a lot of the original 442nd first battalion guys were now uh, members of the 100th. Uh, be that as it may, uh, some of the old timers really didn't want to lose the separate distinction. And they, they, as I told you, some of them really wanted to keep the red bowl patch versus the, the torch that goes with the 442nd. Be that as it may, they moved out as is now the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, often called the 100th 442nd Regimental Combat Team in recognition of the 100th Battalion's uh, unique role. Their first battle was Belvedere. When they got to Belvedere, the, the, battalion, the regimental commander had second and third battalions leading. This was their baptism of fire, 100th Battalion in the rear. Uh, they ran into mortar and artillery fire. And like young troops, fresh troops, I should say new troops, first time under fire, it's difficult. They were stalled. The regimental commander committed the 100th Battalion. The 100th Battalion is it is is it had learned to avoid the frontal assault. They went around like this with, um, notice the way they, here's Belvedere, they're going around Belvedere. Uh, they, they have B Company leading, A Company trailing, and the rest of the battalion following. B Company goes in and with their, now this is a battalion. This is a German battalion, very experienced. This is a battalion. Remember I told you three to one, this is one to one and they're defending, they're dug in. But the 100 battalion goes around, B Company comes in and says, okay. A B Company commander says, uh, first platoon, uh, you take Belvedere. They take the city in one hour. This one platoon goes in there. The other platoon cuts the road out and the other platoon uh, interdicts. They so stun the Germans, uh, this platoon overruns a uh, heavy artillery unit, destroys four guns, and, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> destroys four guns, kills 18. The third platoon down in here catches 17 Jeeps full of Germans trying to escape, and they destroy all 17. And because they were in among the German unit, they disintegrated and they tried to get away. And the one company 
wreaked havoc and then they were they got low on ammo and then a company came in and you can see they're heading on they destroyed this german battalion and they were awarded the president's unit citation then it was known as a distinguished unit citation for extraordinary they also showed the second third battalions in a way how it's done and that was a lesson well learned and it was the great feat of arms uh, by the hundred battalion Uh, this is what Belvedere looks like. You can see it's a gentle hill, but they just went around. And here is General Mark Clark decorating personally, but this is when he gave the distinguished unit citation. Um, I will go on just quickly to Hill 140. Uh, the second battalion of the 442nd, it was a brutal, brutal, bitter fight for them. Uh, they took a lot of losses to take the hill. The 100th battalion relieved them and two members, uh, one member, uh, Koro Moto um, received the Medal of Honor for what he did at, at Castellino. He was a scout. He was an interesting story. He was a scout and he was going forward and he saw two machine gun positions again and he destroyed both of them, but he got wounded and he didn't, uh, wouldn't be evacuated till other people came up, others of his unit. So he goes back along a road, he was wounded to an aid station. And on his way back, he runs into another machine gun position. And yes, he takes that one up also, a remarkable man. Uh, Masato Nakai uh, earns the Medal of Honor at Pisa. And I just don't take the map all the way up to Pisa. And he was the one that again, uh, I mentioned earlier about his weapons skills. He was a, his unit was attacked by an enemy force and his weapon, it was a Tommy gun, was damaged. And he grabbed an M1 and proceeded to fire uh, grenades. And an M1 to fire grenades, you need a different cartridge. You need to put on a different piece of equipment. You need to get rifle grenades. He did all that and he broke up the attack single-handedly. He was badly wounded. He refused to be evacuated. He stayed in his position held it off and broke up the counterattack. Just some pictures in Italy. And I, I think we all know the story of the 100th and the 442nd going to France. I will say one thing. Uh, when the 442nd, the 100th 442nd, <clears throat> they went to port and they were taken to, to France. Uh, that was, they were a part of five divisions that were going into France to support the landing in Normandy. Um, the Germans tracked the 100th Battalion, the 142nd. The, the only regiment I know of that they personally tracked because they had seen the fearsome fighting abilities of the 100th Battalion, the 442nd. They nicknamed them the Fearsome Turks, T-U-R-K-S not the fearsome Nisei or the fearsome uh, Japanese Americans. I think they just didn't want to acknowledge that they were Japanese fighting or Americans, but it was a singular honor for February 2nd, the Germans watched them. They got to France and they joined the 36th Infantry. Remember, they were training to work with different divisions. And here is the, the famous uh, rescue of the lost battalion. This is what general sees. They see arrows moving along the mountain. Soldiers don't see that. Uh, soldiers see something that looks like this. Um, when they're, yes, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, again, a sketch map. I'll talk about Stanley Akita in a minute. But here is the 100th Battalion. They are told to take Bruyere. Bruyere is right here. And the, the, the regiment moves out. I'm just going to focus on the 100th Battalion. There are four hills that encircle Bruyere. And the 100th Battalion mission is to take Hill A. And it's, again, it's a hill. So they're fighting uphill and they're fighting against um, uh, German, well dug in German forces. Uh, B Company is leading. Um, Sakai Takahashi is seriously wounded in, in this battle. A C Company helps and they defeat the enemy. Um, They've had to go 50 yards across open terrain, defended by seven machine guns and heavy automatic weapons. They have to do a frontal assault, uh, which is the worst possible decision. Uh, and they have also have to attack in a forest. 
where the artillery creates wood uh, shrapnel and steel shrapnel. They take the hill and then they push up uh, toward the road between uh, Bruyere of Belmont, you see the 100 Battalion, uh, they push through between the road between Belmont and B. Fontaine. They get in a terrible fight here and then they get ordered to take B. Fontaine. They take B. Fontaine with a vicious fight, but then look and see, here's the 100th Battalion, here's the rest of the regiment. They are out by themselves and the Germans get in behind them. They are isolated and they hold out for three days. Um, while there, they have wounded, they have to get out. And so they have a litter party uh, of 18, 20, 20 men actually, um, to try to get to Belmont with the wounded. The litter party gets uh, intercepted by the Germans. They capture them. Uh, Stanley Akita was a personal friend of mine and it has written a long account of what it's like to be a prisoner. Um, they were carrying young Oak Kim, ubiquitous young Oak Kim. Uh, he jumps off the litter and runs away, but the other 18 are captured. It's the largest POW loss to the, the 142nd. Uh, the 18 of them are shipped back to Germany. And if you can read Stanley's account of what it's like in a POW com a compound for Japanese American, it'll be interesting. They do hold out for B. Fontaine for three days. When they're finally relieved by a battalion of the regiment gets in there, relieves them. They go back to Belmont for a rest. They think they're going to rest for several days. They don't. They're told, rescue the lost battalion. This is the terrain. My wife and I have been to Bruyere, and this is what it's like. These are, these are incredible slopes to fight up. The rescue of the lost battalion, the 36th Division could not do it with the other forces. So they sent, after only 36 hours of rest, the forces, um, I'll just track the 100 battalion. They just moved doggedly fighting enemy position after enemy position. They hit by artillery here, minefield here, prepared enemy positions, enemy roadblock. By the way, the enemy got in behind them and cut their wire communications. They doggedly kept on and burst through uh, with their B company to link up with the first of 141st. Some other time I'll talk about the entire 442nd effort, but we're focusing just on the 100th Battalion. Um, an incredible feat of arms that uh, this is what, what it looked like it, it, where the 141st was. Um, with the 100th Battalion, each company only had eight or nine people who had come ashore at Salerno to give you an idea of the losses along the way. And third platoon of A Company uh, only had two people left that had been with them since Camp McCoy. And after the rescue of the lost battalion, none of them made it. So the none of the platoon was there. This is the famous picture of the, the General Dahlquist, the commander of the 36th Division, said, I want to thank uh, the 442nd and he was distressed when he saw the formation because there were so few people there. He demanded the regimental commander, I told you, says he, I wanted everybody, to which the regimental commander with tears said, this is all that's left. Uh, they lost as a, as a regiment 811 killed or wounded to rescue 214. Um, they went back to Italy, the 442nd, less the, um, excuse me, <clears throat> less the uh, artillery battalion. The 100th went with them. Uh, everybody, uh, General Clark wanted the, the boys back. Uh, General Devers wanted to keep them. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had to decide the 442nd goes to Italy. And they get to Italy and they join the 92nd Infantry Division, which is Fifth Army facing the, the uh, Gothic line. And this is the order that the, was put out the 92nd Infantry troops. Uh, these are just four of the eight paragraphs. Orders are provisionally carried out with a question. Uh, they will never, they will always get up and move out forward at zero hour. 
it's usually better to allow the squatter platoon to work out its own method of dealing with a particular situation. And they had been held up for five months until the 442nd got there. Uh, the 442nd officers, to include the 100, went out and reconnoitered. And uh, they reported back that we'll be through in 45 minutes. Um, they did get through and they, they began to crack it in 45 minutes. It was over in a day or two, and then it was off. Again, generals like these maps, uh, soldiers like this map. This is the 100th mission. Uh, and this was just a little, these are small hills. This is Florida, Georgia, and Ohio one, two, three. These mean a lot to soldiers. Uh, they, the, 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 the approach was simply go up, let company A um, control the line of contact, the line of departure, and then B company go this way, I'm sorry, B company go this way and that way, C company go around the flank, and they attack the positions uh, here. This is where Spud Munamori uh, earned the Medal of Honor posthumously. He was up here. Uh, as they were attacking, the Germans were throwing grenades down on him. Uh, his squad leader was killed or badly wounded. He took charge, and as he stood up to throw grenades, a German grenade bounced off his helmet and fell to the ground. He dove on to protect his other soldiers. He would be awarded the Medal of Honor in 1946 by congressional action. They continue on, go back, go back. They continue on um, and take down the enemy positions one at a time. Uh, B Company takes down Rocky Ridge. This is just one action. These are the individual companies uh, that they fought. This, this was bitter fighting. The Germans knew this was essentially their last stand. Uh, once this was breached, it was breached in about two days, then the Gothic line was, sheer, was permanently breached uh, on the Western end. Uh, there, to give you an idea of the terrain, look at that. And men fought in that. And the 100 Battalion fought along with the 42nd, 442nd brothers. A uh, little card, little humor, Lieutenant, Lieutenant says to hit the deck and dig in. Um, yeah, right. Uh, the Medals of Honor, I tried to touch on all of them. I, I thought it's interesting, it's important that we remember them. They're representative of their buddies. There are many, many, many members of the 100 Battalion that would have earned the Medal of Honor if people had seen, reported, and there's just such chaos in, in the infantry battle. But these are the ones that were recognized 50 years late, uh, thanks to uh, Senator Kaka, who had a review of all the Distinguished Service Crosses and these were all upgraded, except Sadeo Munamori, Spud, because he liked potatoes. Uh, his in 1946, because of congressional action. Uh, President Unit Citation, the highest award uh, unit been given for combat. Um, it's equivalent to the Distinguished Service Cross, is if every man in the unit earned the DSC. They got them for, this is Belvedere, uh, the, the rest of the Lost Battalion, those are the, the towns. And then this was the breaching the Gothic line. These are the Italian cities. Uh, what did people say? Bill Malden, who was a correspondent, you may know that name. No combat unit in the army could exceed the Japanese Americans in loyalty, hard work, courage, and sacrifice. Hardly a man of them had been decorated at least twice and their casualty lists were appalling. As far as the army was concerned, the Nisei could do no wrong. Uh, they came home, uh, uh, emotional homecoming. Uh, we can all recognize the emotion here of the father, the happiness to be back in, in uh, Honolulu or Hawaii somewhere, and then President uh, Truman paying respects and honor. And of course, the famous quotation from Truman, you fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you have won. General Clark, no doubt in my mind that every soldier of the 442nd RCT, 100th, um, consciously bore in his soldiers the reputation of all Japanese Americans. Clark went up and down the West Coast to talk to any group about the heroism of the Nisei soldier. And lastly, they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, the highest civilian award, an expression of national appreciation 
And again, one of the paragraphs, due to their bravery and valor, members of the battalion, the 100th, were honored with six awards the Distinguished Service Cross in the first eight weeks. Um, that was noted in the official army history as an extraordinary. And of course, the 442nd writ large, the 142nd most decorated unit. Why, I asked uh, my, my buddy, well, who's gone now, Eddie Ichiyama, and some of you have heard me say this. He says, because we were a segregated unit, we all had the same values, whether Little Tokyo or, or the plantation life in Hawaii, it didn't matter. We all understood those words, uh, obligation, duty, honor, loyalty, gratitude, tenacity, no brink shame. Thank you. Thank you, uh, General Bramlett. I, I don't think that there is anything that I can say that would augment anything that you have shared, except thank you uh, for putting this together and for making us all realize um, why we do what we do. That was um, extraordinary. Um, I wanted to, to have, if you have time, to go over a couple of the questions that sure. have come in, if that's that's okay. Um, <clears throat> yes. First, this is from Stuart um, Harai, and uh, he was asking, how long did it take soldiers in the other units, such as the 3rd, 34th, 36th, and 45th, to accept the Nisei soldiers in combat? Um, uh, he went, goes on to say that he was in contact with a veteran of the 34th and was told initially that the Nisei were not accepted at first. Um, do you have any idea on how many battles or what did it take for these men to be treated as comrades in arms? Well, the, the account I read is when they, uh, when they got there to North Africa, they were assigned to the 133rd. And when they went to 133rd bivouac area, uh, General, uh, Colonel Turner and, and the senior leaders, they said, bring the, bring the battalion over. We want to welcome them. And they talked about the warm welcome. Now, having said that, there are a lot of accounts for other units that didn't work with them and see them in action that were not excited about it. And so I very likely, I, it'd be interesting if that 34 soldier, I wonder what regiment he was in, but I think by the time they had fought at Casino, everybody in the 34th, uh, because 34th was the first division that just got mangled uh, by, by relentless attacks. So I think by, by certainly by Casino, their reputation in the news media, the correspondents came back just saying they're incredible. So I, I think 30, 36, by the time they got to 36, they were happy to see them. And certainly after they were, uh, rescued the Lost Battalion, the 45th, I don't know. The 45th, they, uh, whoever asked that question knew that the, um, the 442nd with the 100th Battalion had, had worked with the 45th. I just don't have a, a feel for that, that particular okay. division. Um, we have a, a handful of questions coming in. And again, if we, we don't get to all of them, I do apologize for that. Um, uh, Stuart had another, another question. At Mount uh, Majo, when the 100th Infantry Battalion was attached to the 1st Special Service Force, commanded by Colonel Robert um, Frederick in January 1944, were the Nisei aware that Frederick received his first DSC and a promotion to general during or after this engagement? No, no, that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to learn that. I, I read about that it's just in the effort to try to cover as much as I could. I didn't talk about the, the Majo Hill complex, but the first special services, um, the, the accounts I read, they, they got worked with them for a while, but there was no uh, discussion of their commander per se. But, but that, that, I appreciate that factoid from, from the viewer. Okay, we're gonna take uh, two more questions. The first is from Walter Ozawa, and he's asking, can you say a bit more about General John Dahlquist's career after his command of the division in World War II? Um, <laughs> oh God, way to go, Walter. The um, Dahlquist is not one of my favorite characters. I, I just think I, I didn't have a chance to, if we ever do an in-depth in study or discussion of that whole campaign with the 36th. He went on, uh, he was relatively successful. 
uh, but but I, his 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 command during this the, the battle when he had the the 442nd with him was is not an example of generalship. I'll leave, I'll leave that. I can't go into detail, Walter. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Lyman Morikawa is asking that uh, he says we understand that the rescue of the lost battalion uh, played a role in Hawaii statehood. Can you comment on this? And um, Texans in Congress had many leaders in Congress, but can you talk about the rescue of the Lost Battalion and how that played a role in Hawaii statehood? Well, I know the Texans, uh, the 141st, I think is, um, they, all, they all, obviously, I think they were mostly from San Antonio, as I recall. Uh, Texas is very grateful. Of course, the 442nd are honorary members, honorary Texans, an honor they don't bestow lightly. And there is also a highway named uh, 442nd Highway. Or, so I know it's prominent. I honestly can't comment on the direct relationship other than that when Hawaii was seeking statehood, it needed support from, uh, from the other states. And Texans being Texans were probably very outspoken in their support. Uh, before, I'm going to uh, just uh, thank everybody for joining us today and uh, come back to you in a moment, General Bramlett, but maybe you want to answer the, the final questions that are here. They're all, they're all rather similar. Carlene Chinnon is asking, how is this history relevant today? Michael Yaguchi is saying, brilliant webinar. How does the legacy of the World War II Nisei soldier uh, teach our future generations? And um, Stuart Harai, again, is just saying thank you for all that you do uh, to increase the awareness of the, of the Nisei soldiers. So maybe in your closing remarks, you can comment and, and uh, answer those, those, those final questions. We want to thank all of you for being with us today, for uh, being with us on all of our webinars. Um, if you are interested in future talks, uh, of which we have a whole calendar full in April, uh, please go to our website at nvmc.org, Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, nvmc.org to see what is coming up in April. Uh, we definitely hope to have General Bramlett on again this year uh, to share more stories. And uh, we just wanna thank you, General Bramlett, for, for taking your time for for sharing all of this and all those names that you shared with us today. I know they uh, uh, have a long legacy here in Maui and uh, within our state. So, so thank you for that. But I'm gonna turn it back over to you, General Bramlett, to just give us some closing remarks and maybe touch on those uh, comments from the, from the audience. Thank you, Deidre. The, 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 the first one I'd like to not apologize, but just explain that I'm, uh, not able in, in the short time to do the 100th Battalion justice. I hope that, that you've got a feel for just some of the, the, the adversity they faced uh, in the battlefield. And I didn't touch on the adversity they faced uh, certain to, to a degree, certainly in Hawaii, and, and uh, a horrible travesty on the mainland with the uh, internment of, of over 120,000. Uh, that, that's a whole different issue. As uh, how relevant is today for the military to study the tenacity, the leadership to persevere with uh, in, incredible odds to, to have leadership come up from, from the ranks and do what they did facing what they did. That's the military. But the larger issue is uh, simply put, if you think you got problems, you've got adversity, Look what they faced on the battlefield and look what they faced at home. And I said, certainly the, the, the mainland um, Japanese Americans had a different experience. And, and certainly in Hawaii, as, as you know, we had a, a portion of, of our Japanese American population incarcerated as well. Um, but it was not easy for many when they came home, but they persevered and became leaders in our government, leaders in our communities. Uh, and I think that's a lesson. When we talk, uh, several of us give sessions with high school kids. We, we do a presentation on the Nisei soldier and we tell them, look, you can persevere. Look what they did. Look at their example. This is not theoretical. This is an example of what they faced, discrimination, distrust, 
uh, suspicion. And still they went and said, we'll make it, we'll persevere. So let me stop there. I think so that's relevant today uh, is, and it's relative for our future. And that's why I have to keep this legacy alive. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, we're so appreciative of your time and everybody who joined the, the webinar today. Uh, until we all meet again, we wish you all the best. Be well, stay safe. Thank you, General Bramlett. Thank you, Dr. Nora. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.